أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Lesson number 131 Surah Ibrahim will begin from ayah number 42 ولا تحسبن الله غافلا عما يعمل الظالمون And never think that Allah is unaware of what the wrongdoers do Never think that Allah is unaware that he has no idea about what these people are doing Innama, indeed not but, yu'akhiruhum, he delays them, meaning he delays their punishment. For when, liyawmin for a day, tashkhasu fihi al-abusar, when eyes will stare in horror, meaning the day of judgment. Wala tahsabanna. Tahsabanna from the root letters, ha, seen ba. And la tahsabanna, never, ever think like this. Never assume. Never suppose. And this address is first of all to the Prophet ﷺ. Why? In order to comfort him. That do not think like this. Do not think that Allah is ghafilan, one who is unaware, عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ zalimun from what the wrongdoers are doing. Never think that he is unaware of their activities. And secondly, this address is also to the zalimun, indirectly. This is basically a threat to them. Those people who think like this, that Allah does not have any idea about the evil actions that the zalimun, the oppressors, the unjust people are doing. Now what kind of actions are the zalimun committing? Various types. First of all, of zulm. يَعْمَلُ zalimun. But now the question is, what is zulm over here? As you know that zulm is used for shirk. Inna shirka la zulmun azim. So those people who are doing shirk, you wonder, How come they're not punished? If we learn in the Quran in Surah Maryam that just a kalima, just a statement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a child is such a huge, is such a big deal that it could cause the skies to rupture, it could cause the entire earth to break asunder, to split apart. It's such a big statement, it's such an atrocious crime. Then how come the people who are saying such statements all of the time, they're not punished? So never think that Allah is unaware. So zulm refers to shirk. Similarly, zulm also refers to their opposition, their oppression against the believers. So don't think that Allah is unaware. Then why does He not punish them? Because He is yu'akhiruhum, He is delaying them. From the root letters, Hamza Khara. لِيَوْمٍ for a day, تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ تَشْخَصُ from the root letters, شِينْ خَا صَادِ And shukhus is to continue to stare at something without blinking. What does it mean? To continue to stare at something, to continue to look at something without even blinking one's eyes. And in particular, it is to stare at something that is distant, that is far in the distance. And if a person is staring at it without blinking his eyes, what's going to happen? His eyes, they will widen. They will open up even more. And generally, this is the state of a person when he is fearful, when he is scared. Because when a person is frightened, then he's not able to close his eyes even. He's not able to blink his eyes even. So, tashkhasu, it will stare in horror, forgetting to blink. Fihi, in it, meaning during that day, al-absar, the sights. Al-absar is the plural of basar. Meaning the eyes of people will stare in horror on that day. Why? Because of what they will witness. Because of the horrors of that day. In this ayah primarily, the Prophet ﷺ is being comforted. The Prophet ﷺ was going through such a time in Mecca where he and his followers were weak. They were being oppressed. And the enemy, the mushrikeen, they were strong. And at the same time, they were very oppressive. We have heard about the stories of how the Sahaba were persecuted in Mecca. Not just the Sahaba, but even the Prophet ﷺ. Physically persecuted, physically abused, socially, emotionally, mentally. There was so much torture that was going on. Now at these times, when a person is being oppressed by another, when a person is suffering from so much at the hands of the other, and he is unable to defend himself, and at the same time your own brothers and sisters are being oppressed because of their faith. 
Now just imagine the Prophet ﷺ, not just him, but the rest of the believers. We have heard about the family of Ammar ibn Yasir. How they were persecuted, how they were tortured, how they were killed. So in this situation where you feel you cannot defend yourself and at the same time you cannot even go and help out the rest of the believers. You feel as though your hands are tied. You're not in a situation to help one another. You are unable to bring a change to the current situation. What do you feel? You begin to wonder, where is the help of Allah? How come these oppressors are allowed to do whatever they can, whatever they want to? How come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them so much respite? A person begins to wonder. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforts His Messenger over here. And the believer as well, when he is in a similar situation, that Allah knows exactly what is going on. Don't think that he is unaware. He knows exactly what is going on. And he is only delaying the punishment of these people when they will not be able to escape. Now the question is, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delay the punishment? Why doesn't he punish them right now? Why doesn't he punish them immediately? Because this life is a test. If you think about it, in this dunya, there is so much violence, so much oppression. So many innocent people are being killed, are being persecuted, are being tortured in the most horrendous of ways. If you ever hear about how people are being killed, how people are being tortured in prisons outside, it's shocking. You cannot even hear those stories, let alone going through these incidents. So just imagine at the time of the Prophet ﷺ as well, the believers were going through a similar situation. People begin to wonder, how come there is violence in this world? How come Allah allows poverty and oppression to exist in this world? How come there are natural disasters? How come there is this and there is that? People wonder. But what does Allah say? This life is a test. This life is a test. And every person is given the freedom of choice. You choose what you want to do. Go ahead, do whatever you want to do. Tomorrow you'll find out the consequences of your actions. And the punishment is delayed because the punishment that is given on that day, no one will be able to escape it. Because on that day, when their eyes will stare in horror at the horrible scene of punishment, what's going to happen? Muhti'ina, racing ahead. Muqni'i ru'usihim, their heads raised up. Muhti'ina is the plural of muhti' from the root letters ha ta ain ha ta ain and ihta is basically isra which is to run fast to walk fast when a person is walking fast when a person is trying to run fast what happens his neck is outstretched he is protruding his neck out Generally, when a person is trying to walk fast or run fast, his neck is outstretched, it is protruding out. So, ihtar, muhtir, is used for a person who is walking or running fast with his neck outstretched. With his neck outstretched. Similarly, muhtir is also used for a person who is racing ahead with his sight Raised with humility and shame and embarrassment. A person who is running, who is walking, with his eyes lifted up, how? With humility and shame, embarrassment. So muhti'ina, ones who will be racing ahead. But how will they be racing ahead? Muqni'i. Muqni'i is a plural of muqni'i. And muqni'i is from the root letters qaf, noon, ayn, from the word qana'a, which is to be Satisfied. But the word qunur is to raise. What does it mean? To raise. Because when a person is satisfied, his spirits are always raised and they're high. So qunur is to raise. And muqnir is fa'il, one who raises. One who lifts up. And over here, what are they lifting up? Ru'us. Ru'us is a plural of ra's. Aqna' ra'sahu is when a person lifts his head up. Why? In order to run fast. So muhti'ina, ones who are racing ahead. Muqni'i, ones who are raising their heads. Ru'us, their heads, they have raised them up. What are they racing ahead to? Where are they headed to? Where are they running towards? Towards the caller. Because we know that on the day of judgment, 
the caller will call out. The trumpet will be blown. So when the trumpet will be blown, everyone is going to rush towards where that sound is coming from. So muhti'ina ila da'i. They'll be running towards the caller. And they'll be running out of fear towards the sound of the trumpet, just like a stampede. لا يرتد إليهم طرفهم Their glance will not return to them. يرتد from the root letters را دال دال from the word رد. And رد is to return, to send something back. So their طرف, their glance, their look, their sight, their gaze, it's not going to return to them. What does it mean? They will not blink their eyes. Their eyes will not return to them. Their glance will not return to them, meaning they will not even blink their eyes. They will remain staring unblinkingly. Staring in horror, staring in confusion, trying not to blink because of the extreme horror that they will be experiencing. Sometimes it happens that when a person is terrified, he's not even able to blink his eyes. He's not able to blink his eyes. He's just continuously looking, staring. So this is going to be the state of the people on the Day of Judgment. And what's going to be the state of their hearts? وَأَفْئِدَةُ to whom And their hearts, they will be hawa, empty, void. Everybody, turn your cell phones off. Put them on silent immediately. I don't want to hear any more cell phones in the classroom, please. And now we should change our ringtones. I mean, music, how can we have that on our phones? If we have a beep or if we have a ring, just like a normal phone ring, Is that not enough? Is that not sufficient? Why do we have to have music playing all the time? Earning sin, listening to haram, especially in the majlis of Quran, this is not acceptable. So please change your ringtones, keep them moderate, keep them simple, and during class, keep your phones off, keep them on silent. So لا يعتدوا إليهم طرفهم Their glance will not return to them, meaning they will not even blink their eyes. وَأَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَىٰ And their hearts will be empty. They will be void. Hawa is from the root letters هَا وَوْيَا And Hawa is basically the empty space that is between the sky and the earth. The empty space between sky and earth. And from this Hawa is used for a void, empty space in something. And قَلْبٌ هَوَىٰ An empty heart is used for a person who is extremely cowardly, who is extremely fearful, who does not have any confidence. So, أَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَىٰ Their hearts will be empty, meaning they'll be void of any thought. They will not be able to think about anything. They will not be able to remember anything. They will not be able to retain anything. They will not be able to keep themselves calm or comfortable? No. Their hearts will be void, empty. And sometimes when a person is going through extreme fear and shock, what happens? He feels as though he cannot think anymore. Sometimes people say, I feel numb. I can't think properly. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to say. People become speechless. So on seeing the horrors of the Day of Judgment, the hearts of people will become hawa, empty. Why? Because all of this is going to be so sudden, so unexpected, and so scary, that it's going to frighten them, and it's going to take every thought away from their heart. Normally you think about it, the heart is never empty. Never at all. You're always thinking about something or the other. Even when you're lying down, nobody's talking to you. Perhaps your eyes are even closed. Still, your heart, something or the other is going on. You're feeling something, you're thinking about something. But this is a state of extreme fear when the heart will be completely void of any thought. Any thought at all. A person will not remember his children. A person will not remember his wife. A person will not remember his wealth. He will not remember any of the strategies that he had thought on the Day of Judgment. No, nothing is going to come to him. أَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَىٰ And what will they do? They will just proceed to the sound that is calling them. They will go towards the caller. We learn in Surah Taha, Ayah 108, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ الدَّاعِيَ لَا عِوَجَ لَهُ That day, everyone will follow the call of the caller with no deviation therefrom. No one will be able to deviate from going towards the caller. And all voices will be stilled. وَخَشَعَتِ الْأَصْوَاتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ 
all voices will be stilled, they will be humbled for the most merciful. فَلَا تَسْمَعُ إِلَّا هَمْسَ So you will not hear except the whisper of footsteps. The whisper of footsteps. No one will utter a sound even. All that you'll be able to hear is the sound of footsteps. Similarly in Surah Al-Qamr, ayah number 8, we learn, مُهْتِعِينَ إِلَى الدَّاعِ All of them will be hastening towards the caller. So what do we see? That everyone will experience some horror of that day, of that great day. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنذِرِ النَّاسَ And warn the people, all people, whether believers or non-believers, all people, warn them. Because everyone is going to experience this day. No one is going to be absent. No one will be able to escape that day. And it's a tremendous day. When each person will experience some horror. So, Andirin Nasa, warn the people. Of what? Yawma yatihim, of a day when it will come to them. What will come to them? Al adabu, the punishment. The day when the punishment will come to them. What is this day? It could refer to the day of death. And it could also refer to the day of judgment. Fayakulun ladina zalamu. Then the wrongdoers will say, what zulm have they committed? Shirk, kufr. And remember, zulm also includes ma'asiyah, acts of disobedience, oppression, injustice. So those people who have done zulm, they will say, Rabbana, O oh our Lord, akhirna ila ajalin qareeb. Delay us till a near term. Give us some more time. Akhirna. Akhirna from Hamza Khara, ta'khir, which is to defer, to delay. So, akhirna, give us more time, delay our punishment, delay our hisab, delay our death, ila ajalin qareeb, until a time that is qareeb, that is near. Meaning for a short time, for just some time, not very long. Just give me a few more hours, just give me a few more days, a few more weeks, a few more years. Ajalin qareeb, just some time give me. And this time, what will I do? What will we do? Nujib da'wataka. We will respond to your call. Give us some more time and we will respond to your call. Your call? What does it mean by your call? Meaning your commands. Your instructions. We will respond to them. We will accept them. We will observe them. Like we learned earlier, that لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ What does it mean by istajabu لِرَبِّهِمْ? They believe and they accept the commands. They observe them. So we will respond to your call. وَنَتَّبِعُ الرُّسُلَ And we will also follow the messengers. Because following one messenger is like following all of the messengers. So we will follow the messengers. Give us some more time. Send us back. Don't make us die right now. Give us some more time so we can respond to your call. We will obey you and we will follow the messengers. But what is the response that will be given to them? That أَوَلَمْ تَكُونُوا أَقْسَمْتُمْ did you not used to swear min qablu from before? Aqsamtum from the root letters qaf sin meem. Did you not used to swear before min qablu from before that malakum not for you min zawal any decline? Did you not swear oaths before that you were never going to suffer a decline? The word zawal is from the root letters zay waw lam. And zawal is basically when something begins to descend, begins to come down from its peak. Like for example, the sun, as it rises in the morning, it reaches the peak, it reaches the height, and then from that point onwards, it begins to decline. So zawal is decline, disappearance, cessation, the setting of something, the coming to an end of something. So did you not used to swear before that you were never going to suffer any decline? You were never going to cease to exist. What does it mean by this? Meaning, did you not have such plans in your worldly life for many, many years that you were going to do this and you were going to do that and you were going to do something for a few years and then another thing for another few years? You had all of these long plans thinking as though you were never going to die. Thinking as if death was never going to approach you. You made the dunya your eternal home thinking that you were never going to leave that home. Which is why all of your priorities were for the dunya. You never thought about the hereafter. 
Never for a moment did you think, but what if I die before that? What if death comes to me before that? أَوَلَمْ تَكُونُوا أَقْسَمْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلُوا مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ زَوَالِ That you were never going to have any decline? Or that you were never going to face the hereafter? That there is no akhirah? That there is no jannah? That there is no jahannam? Did you not used to swear that before? We see that people in general are so unaware of their end, especially about their death. They're so negligent, they're so heedless about it. They're so heedless of the hereafter that in their life plan, there is nothing that accommodates something that they have to do for the sake of their akhirah. If you think about it in this dunya, what are we told? Study, go to school, and then go to school again, and then go to university, and then apply here, and then apply there, work for these many years, and then buy a house. In this whole life plan that people give you, that people present to you, is there any room for preparation for the akhirah? Nothing at all. People overall are very negligent, very heedless towards the day that they will die and the day that they will face their end result. Generally, this is the way of common people. But the fact is that when death comes to a person, whatever that he has attained is going to be left behind. And it's going to be left behind for who? For his heirs. And the only thing that is going to go with him is what he prepared for the akhirah. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said that kun fi dunya ka annaka gharib aw abir sabil. Abdullah ibn Umar anhu he narrates that once the Prophet ﷺ took hold of my shoulder and he said, "Be in this world as if you were a stranger or a traveler." Because a stranger, when he is in a particular land, when he's visiting a particular city, does he consider that to be his own house? No. He will keep limited amount of stuff with him. Similarly, if a person is traveling, what will he keep with himself? The bare minimum, the basic necessities, without which he cannot survive. That's all that he will keep. He will not take a lot with him. Why? Because he knows it's not his destination. He is in a transitory state. And if he were to take a lot of stuff with him, it would make his travel very difficult. And he might not be able to achieve the reason as to why he was traveling. Just imagine if a person is traveling with a lot of stuff. How can he travel? It will make it so difficult for him. For example, if a person goes to spend a week in the house of his relatives, then what happens? If he's taking everything with him, half the time he's going to spend in setting up and then packing up. How much time is he going to get in really meeting people and talking to them? He won't be able to. So a traveler always travels light with the basic necessities. And this is the advice that the Prophet ﷺ gave to us, that live in this world as if you're a traveler, live in this world as if you're a stranger, as if you have nothing to do in this dunya. You're only passing from here. Because this life is temporary. And anything that a person has attained in this dunya, it's going to be left behind, except for the deeds that he's taking with himself for the hereafter. Therefore, a person should not make this dunya his home. Whatever plans that he is making, any plans that he makes, he must accommodate preparation for the akhirah in it. That should be his highest priority. Many times people are thinking about their marriage, about their children. They will make a plan. This is when we will get married. This is when we will have children. This is when we will move. This is when we will do this. But there should be a solid plan with regards to the akhirah as well. Because the children will remain behind. The marriage will be finished. But what's going to remain are the deeds. Which is why we see that many people, every single person, will wish at the time of death that he had more time. We learn in Surah Al-Munafiqun, ayah number 10, فَيَقُولَ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا أَخَرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجْلٍ قَرِيبٍ فَأَصَّدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And he says, My Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term, if only you would give me some more time, so that I would give charity, I would give sadaqa, and I would be among those who are righteous. Many times what happens? People generally say that when we are done with this, then I will do such and such. When I'm done with the course, when I'm married, When my children are older, when I have grown older, then I will do such and such. But the fact is that how do you know you will reach that stage? 
How do you know there will be a time when you will be older and you will not have anything to do? As you go through life, you only get busier and busier. Remember that. Today you think you have children and they're occupying you. Tomorrow you will have your children and their spouses and their children who will occupy you even more. Today you think you are too busy with something or the other. Tomorrow you'll have a spouse and then you'll have children to look after. So never at all should a person make excuses for not doing good. Never should a person delay for a later stage because you never know when and if you will get that stage, you will reach that stage. And if you do reach that stage, how do you think that automatically you will change and automatically you'll be inclined to reciting more Qur'an and automatically you'll be inclined to memorizing the Qur'an? How is it possible? If you haven't done something for years and years, how do you think that automatically you will change within days, within moments? The change has to come from within and it has to start from the beginning. You cannot expect a complete change just one day. Similarly, we learn in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Ayah 99 and 100, that حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ رَبِّ ارْجِعُونَ Until when death comes to one of them, he says, My Lord, send me back. لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِيمَا تَرَكْتِ So that I can do righteous deeds which I left behind. I delayed performing those righteous deeds. Send me back so that I can do them. What does Allah say? كَلَّا إِنَّهَا كَلِمَةٌ هُوَ قَائِلُهَا Nay, it's only a statement that he's saying. It's only a statement that he's saying. He doesn't mean it. Because if he were to be returned to dunya, then he is going to return to his same habits. Again, he will have no time to worship Allah. Again, he will have no time to give sadaqah. He will be busy doing something else or the other, occupied with other things. The fact is that if something is important to you, you have to make time for it now. You have to make time for it now. You cannot think that later you'll be able to do it. You cannot defer it for a later stage. Because if you defer it for a later stage, what's going to happen? Perhaps you'll forget to do it. Perhaps you won't even remember how to do it. Or you might not even get a chance to do it. So do it now. Don't delay till later. Do it now. And if we think that we are too busy, that we don't have time to accomplish our goals, then this is a symptom of a much bigger problem. What is a bigger problem? That a person is not doing enough ibadah. How do we know that? The Prophet ﷺ said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that, Ya, ya ibn Adam, O son of Adam, tafarragh li ibadati. Set aside time for my worship. Make time so that you can worship me. Make sure you take some time out to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you do that, أَمْلَأُ صَدْرَكَ غِنًا وَأَسُدُّ فَقْرُكَ I will fill your heart with contentment and I will remove your poverty. If you make time for worshipping me, then I'm going to fill your heart with contentment and satisfaction. That even if you have very little, you'll be happy. And your poverty, I will remove it. But if you do not do so, if you do not take time out for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I will keep both your hands busy in work. I will keep both your hands busy in work and I will not remove your poverty. I will not remove your poverty. You will feel poor. You will never have any contentment. You perhaps will have a lot, but you will never feel that it is enough. So if we find ourselves too busy to recite the Qur'an, too busy to pray our sunnah, too busy to fulfill our responsibilities, then what does it mean? We are not taking out enough time for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's the promise of Allah. If you take time out for ibadah, He will enable you to complete your tasks, to fulfill your tasks. He will give you contentment. He will give you satisfaction. And when does a person truly have contentment and satisfaction? When he has achieved his goals. So we should not delay our work and do it right now. And if you want help in doing it, then take time out for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you find it difficult to memorize your lesson, you feel there's no time, take time out to recite the Qur'an. If you find it difficult to complete the work that has been assigned to you, check your salah, check your salah, check your fasting, check your dhikr. 
is that sufficient or not? Is that enough? Or are you barely doing the bare minimum? What is a level? If you want help in your other work, then you must increase in your ibadah. 